Well, this evening we're continuing Psalm 119, and the section we're looking at is um, verses 145 through 152, and that will be, of course, you can follow along in your Bibles, or it will be displayed on the screen behind me. But let's begin by reading this uh, text of Scripture. By the way, I'll, uh, it's no surprise this is talking again about obedience. Obedience is rather a large theme in Scripture. So we shouldn't be surprised by that because it happens to be the end for which the Lord saved us and left us in this world, that we might obey Him and by obeying Him become more like His Son, that we might be as lights in the world. So let's read Psalm 119 beginning in verse 145. The psalmist writes this, I cried with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, I will observe your statutes. I cry to you, save me, and I shall keep your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to your ordinances. Those who follow after wickedness draw near. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Of old I have known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. May the Lord bless his word again uh, to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning we saw that we should keep the commandments and we should do it as Jesus did. We need to follow his example. And this morning we saw that Jesus wasn't content with just general obedience, but just sort of being in the ballpark of what it is his father wanted him to do, but he did exactly what his father wanted him to do. Now, he did this to save us, of course, but he also did it as an example to us of how precise, of how careful we should be in keeping the commandments of God. I mean, we, we also, I, well, I think, saw that just deviance from even the commandments in the slightest way is, is going to get us into difficulty. It's enough to condemn a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, remember, Jesus lifted these commandments back up to where His Father intended so that we would know exactly what it is that He wants us to be doing. Obedience is important to the Lord. It's the reason why Jesus came into the world. It's the reason why He became a man. He didn't come merely to save us from guilt, from punishment in hell, but He came to free us from that which would send us there, and that is our disobedience from all of it. As I mentioned before, even the slightest deviation from anything He commands is enough to send us, apart from the grace of God, into eternal punishment. I mean, just remember what it is that plunged the whole human race into the situation that we're in. It was the eating of a piece of fruit from a tree that was forbidden. It may seem like a small thing, but small, even small sins are not small to the Lord. But again, we need to remember that salvation from hell, which the Lord, of course, has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't the only incentive that the Lord uh, gives to us um, for our obedience. And again, obedience not to save ourselves, but rather as the evidence that we are saved. But we see another incentive that is recurring through this psalm, and that is the promise of deliverance from our enemies. And we need that, don't we? We need deliverance from enemies because we have enemies all around us. You have enemies. Now, the most serious of your enemies, of course, are spiritual enemies, those that are out to destroy your soul if they could. Thankfully, God's not going to let that happen, but they're still there. The devil wants to destroy you, his demons want to destroy you, your flesh wants to destroy you, the world would destroy you if, if it could. Now some, of course, of our enemies appear to be physical. Sometimes, I mean, for instance, uh, we just, I just, well, in the prayer I just mentioned that article that Donna made me aware of, of this family that was just killed, the father and, and his two children because they were Christians. And it may appear as though their enemies were physical enemies, and certainly they were, but the battle was really spiritual, wasn't it? Because there are those that the flesh, Satan, and the world will move to hate you. 
just for being a Christian. There's people out there who would try to tempt you into sin, to get you to fall, that you might be destroyed. People who would threaten you just because you're seeking to love them, just because you're seeking to do what the Lord has called you to do in keeping the commandments, which, as we know, is something that is best for them as well as for you. So again, even though it may appear that some of your enemies are physical, they're actually all spiritual enemies, aren't they? The battle is spiritual. And so, having enemies, what is your best defense against these enemies, all of your enemies? Well, the best defense is obedience. Obedience, because God promises to deliver you from all your enemies, but He only makes that promise to those who obey Him. God blesses obedience. Now, why does He do that? Well, it's not because your obedience earns anything, but it's because your obedience is the evidence that you belong to Him and that the promises belong to you because those promises only belong to those who listen to God and who will submit to Him, and, and that is what every true believer will, of course, do. And, of course, the Lord will deliver you because He sends trials purpose of the trials, the purpose of the enemies is to teach you obedience. So obedience shows that uh, the, the promises actually belong to you, but of course the Lord raises up these enemies in order to teach you obedience. That's really the purpose behind trials in the first place. Now this evening what I'd like us to do is simply follow the prayer of the psalmist as he cries out to the Lord to deliver him from his enemies, to see what it is that you and I should do when we are confronted with our enemies. And what you should do can be summarized in this way. You should renew your obedience to God. And how is it that you can do that? Well, again, let's see what the psalmist had to say in this particular section. First of all, you realize, of course, you need God's help. So the first thing you need to do is pray to the Lord for His help, verses 145 and 146. The psalmist says, I cried with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, I will observe your statutes. I cried to you, save me, and I shall keep your testimonies. Now, the psalmist, of course, here is praying, and that's what you need to do. You need to pray, you need to cry out to the Lord. But I do want you to notice what kind of prayer this is, the intensity of this particular prayer, the fervency with which he prays. Notice he says, I cried with all my heart, not just part of it, but all of it. Now, this is something that I think that more mature Christians, perhaps those who have experienced a little bit more of the Christian life are more aware of than those who are young believers because when you first became a Christian or when you first become a Christian, the Lord does tend to take it easy on you. He doesn't want to, you know, let anything come too strong that's going to take you away, blow you away, or it's going to be too strong for you. He treated you very gently, as, as you do also children. When, when you're raising your children, you know, as they grow older and they learn more and they become more responsible, then you require more of them. The same thing is true with regard to what the Lord does for us. When you're young in the faith, the Lord takes it easy. The trials, these enemies that come against you, you realize they're in His control. Okay? He doesn't allow the trials to be as severe when you're younger, and so course, your prayers aren't going to be quite as fervent. He doesn't demand as much from you before He will answer your prayers when you're young. But as you grow in the Lord, the Lord turns up the heat, doesn't He? Turns up the trial. The trials become more severe. Now, they have to in order to stretch you because now you're stronger. Now you're more mature. Now it takes more uh, to sort of stretch you to that limit that you had, well, that you have now because the limit has expanded. But as the trials become hotter, so does the fervency in your prayers. I mean, the Lord wanted you to become more fervent in your prayers before He would answer them, which is why He turns up the heat so that you will reach out to Him more earnestly. He wants you really to desire what it is you're asking for before the Lord will give it to you. And so He puts you into the circumstances 
that will bring that about. The psalmist says, I cry to you with all my heart. God is looking to see whether you're engaged with all your heart and whether you really desire His help and to be delivered from these enemies. So that's one thing the Lord looks for, I mean, prayer and fervent prayer. But there's another thing He looks for in those prayers. He wants to see in you a greater resolve to obey Him. As I said before, this is the reason why He sent His Son into the world to save you, your obedience, that you might be lights in the world and witnesses to Him. You can only do that by being like Jesus Christ who followed His Father perfectly. But it's also the reason He sends trials. The trials are meant to get you to obey Him more carefully. Again, notice in verses 145 and 146, the psalmist says, Answer me, O Lord, I will observe your statutes. Save me, and I shall keep your testimonies. The psalmist knew what God was after, which is why he was saying, If you'll just answer me, Lord, I, I will do this. I will do what you want me. God wants obedience to be the greatest desire of your heart because of your love for Him. Now, of course, again, Let's, let's make sure we don't misunderstand. We, he wants you to love Him. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to trust in His Son. But the way, as we saw this morning, that you show that love to Him is through your obedience. We can't separate obedience from love because that is the expression of love. God wants obedience to be the greatest desire of your heart because He wants you to love Him more than anything else. So, why is it you should desire to be delivered from your enemies? Well, it should only be for this one reason, that you might serve the Lord. Now, if you come to the Lord and you desire to, you know, to be freed and get His help and to have your trials removed so that you can take it easy or so that you can have more fun or so that nothing will get in the way of what it is you really want to do, well... The Lord's not going to answer that kind of prayer because He brought the trial to drive you out of that in order to bring you into a place where you can obey. That is the desire of every true believer. We might even say this is the difference between the so-called foxhole conversion that you understand you know, came from, I believe it was uh, perhaps a World War I where there were, you know, a lot of the battles, a lot of the war was fought from foxholes, and of course people who were in the foxholes were concerned that they were going to die. Um, so they cried out to, to God, to the higher powers that were, save me and I'll serve you. And of course, once the danger was gone, so was the resolve to serve Him, which is why it's called the foxhole conversion. It only lasts as long as you're in the foxhole. So when the danger's gone, you go back to living the way you were before. Well, that's not the right kind of heart, and that isn't a genuine, that isn't the, the, the evidence of a genuine conversion. The one who is genuine wants to be delivered so that he can obey the Lord. He binds himself to an even closer obedience to the Lord because he knows that's what he wants and he knows that that's what the Lord wants. And of course, again, that's why the Lord sends the trial to show us what's in our hearts and of course to drive us to Him. So first we should ask the question, what's in your heart? Well, it should be, especially when you're faced with trials and trials that come from the various enemies. I, I can't think of trials that don't come from some form of enemy. But your first desire should be that the Lord would deliver you so that you could obey Him better. That is why He sends the trial in the first place, to teach you closer obedience. Well, secondly, when should you pray? Well, you should pray when you can pray best. I know some people here are going to be able to resonate with this particular point because I'm sure you've experienced it, but the psalmist here tells us that he rose before dawn and he also woke up during the night watches and when he did, he would pray and meditate on God's Word, verses 147 and 148. He says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. The night watches, of course, are late in the night, early in the morning. Now, sometimes it's hard to find time during the busyness of the day to pray. There's so many things to do. So, when can you pray? 
Well, you can pray before the day begins, or you can pray during the night. As a matter of fact, you'll find that when something is weighing heavily on your heart, you almost can't avoid it, right? You're going to wake up early. You're going to wake up in the middle of the night. It's not uncommon to find yourself doing that. Waking up before sunrise, waking up in the middle of the night. Well, instead of going back to sleep, perhaps what you should do is pray. That's what the psalmist did. And lay that burden at the foot of the throne of grace. Give it to the Lord. Now, again, here's another indication of just how much you need to want something before the Lord's going to give it to you. I mean, do you want it badly enough to give up your sleep in order to ask for it? If it's not weighing on your heart, if it doesn't interrupt your life in some way, if it's not some kind of a burden, you really can't expect the Lord to, to listen. Prayer needs to be fervent. As James reminds us, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man um, accomplishes much. But the psalmist tells us about something else that you need as well in order for God to hear your prayers. Again, uh, fervency, which we're reminded by the timing of this particular prayer. But you need faith as well. The psalmist says that he rises early before the dawn and he waits for your word, he says. He waits for the Lord's words. You need faith. You need the faith that is necessary to wait on God to give you what it is He promised. That's what the psalmist is talking about. Now, sometimes the wait can be short. As I mentioned before, when you're a young Christian, the Lord doesn't really make you wait that long. He encourages you by answering prayers quickly. Perhaps you noticed that when you were a younger Christian. But as you get older, the time between the petition and the answer to the prayer seems to grow longer when you've walked with Him for a while. But remember, the only reason why you wait at all in answer to God's prayer is because you know that He's going to answer it. You know that He is faithful. You know when you pray according to His will that He hears you and that you have already what it is that you've asked. I mean, God promised that He's going to give it to you. If you ask for what He promises, He's going to give it to you. It's just a matter of when He gives it to you. Well, you will wait like the psalmist upon His Word. You know God is faithful. You know He's going to answer you. Now, you won't seek Him unless you really want what you're asking for, unless there's that fervency. And you're not going to seek Him also unless you really believe that God is faithful to His Word and He's going to give it to you. But again, one other thing that the psalmist mentions here too is along with waiting on the Lord for the answers to these prayers, you also need to study His Word to know what it is He wants you to do. The psalmist didn't put his obedience on hold while he was waiting for the Lord, but while he waited, he studied uh, to know better God's will. And that's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. He says in verse 148, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your words. So while you're waiting on God, you need to find out more about what it is He wants you to do because, again, God wants you to obey. That's the whole purpose behind this. So while you're waiting on the Lord to deliver you, read and study what He wants you to do so that you may do it at all times. Now, thirdly, what should you pray for specifically? Well, certainly that you might know God's Word better, but the psalmist here is praying that God would revive him. Verse 149, hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to your ordinances. In other words, revive my heart along the lines of your commandments. Make me desire them more. Make me want to do them more. Again, why does the Lord send trials? Why does He let your enemies attack you and have any power in your life at all? It's so you can grow, but it's also to awaken you out of spiritual slumber. Now, that's what revival has to do with. Um, revival ha can have two meanings. It can refer to um, awakening people who are unconverted to begin to seek after the Lord when they become concerned about the state of their souls. 
But for the Christian, it means when you fall into this state of spiritual lethargy, it means to be, as it were, awakened out of that drowsiness and again be alert to what it is the Lord actually has made you and called you to do. Now, sadly, when things go well in our lives, we often slip into a spiritual rut, don't we? It causes us to grow spiritually dull so that your devotion and your obedience to the Lord begin to slip and you can begin to fall away from the Lord, fall away from the Lord and go more into the world, but thankfully the Lord's not going to let you leave Him. He's going to keep you close. And the way He does that is by bringing trials to drive you back to Himself. He sends difficulties to wake you up and to compel you to seek Him again. I mentioned before, if we could just learn to seek the Lord with the kind of fervency and consistency and faith that He would have us to do, with which we really ought to be seeking Him anyway, perhaps we wouldn't need so many trials in our lives. Thankfully, the Lord is faithful to bring them, though, because we often do slip into those spiritual ruts. Well, when you do, and again, the Lord sends these trials, He sends these enemies to wake you up, you need to pray that the Lord would save you from those enemies but also that He would work in your life that which He intends through the trial, that He would wake you up again to seek Him with all your heart, that He would revive you, that He would pour out His Holy Spirit again upon you. We see many examples of this in Scripture among God's people. God is always faithful to bring about that revival, and that's just simply a form of discipline that the Lord tells us of in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, finally, um, what reasons, what arguments should you offer to God as to why He should answer your prayers? This particular section has at least four reasons why the Lord should hear. And the first one is His loving kindness. Uh, he pleads that in verse 149, hear my voice according to your loving kindness. In other words, Lord, answer me because of your love. Now, as a, as a Christian, as a believer, you are in a relationship with the Lord because He is your Father, because you are His son or your daughter, because you are in relationship with Him through His covenant, because He is faithful to you, because you are a son, because you are a daughter. Because of His grace and His mercy to you and the Lord Jesus Christ, that is why He's going to answer your prayers. It's not really your obedience that brings that about. You know that you can't do anything that is truly pleasing to the Lord, I mean that is, that is perfect, that has no sin in it. There's nothing you can do to compel God to answer your prayers based upon your works because even your best efforts always fall short of what it is that the Lord wants. But the reason why He will answer is because of His loving kindness. His loving kindness is actually seen in the fact that you want to obey Him at all. It is the evidence of His grace. So when you obey, you're just simply showing that God has already shown you mercy, and it shows you that He is willing to give you all of His mercies. And that's why you plea when you plea it's not on the basis of what you've done, but it's on the basis of His mercy and loving kindness, evident because of your obedience, and you know because of that obedience you're His son and His daughter, and you know that in Jesus Christ He is merciful. And when you plead on that basis of God's mercy and grace in Christ, He will listen to you. So your first argument needs to be His loving kindness and not your righteousness even though I've been emphasizing, and this psalm has been emphasizing again and again, blessings come through obedience. But obedience is simply the evidence that you have received God's mercy. Now, secondly, you can plead the sins of your enemies. Verse 150, those who follow after wickedness draw near. They are far from your law. Now, you are His child. These, though who seek to harm you are His enemies. You can plead their sins, their evil, their hatred against God, against them. 
And if you plead for deliverance from God, save me, I'm your child, save me from those who hate you, God will listen. Thirdly, you can plead the nearness of God. Verse 151, you are near, O Lord. That, that's one thing, of course, you know, we need to be very thankful of. We, we often think about God as being in heaven, we're on earth, and that's the way the Bible rec represents it. His throne is in heaven, the earth is His footstool. But we do need to remember that God being omnipresence, being infinite in every way, His presence is everywhere. He's just as much here as He is in heaven. He's not a God who is far off only, but a God who is near and one who sees and one who knows what you're going through, one who is present with you. And you can plead to this one who is near, especially because of what Jesus has done. He's the one who's reconciled us to the Father. He is the one who has brought us near. We are never spatially far from God, <coughs> not distance-wise, but our relationship. The one who is far off, which we're, we were, have been brought near through Christ. And now the nearness of God is our good. You can call on Him because now <coughs> He is present to save you. He's no longer far off but He is near in the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, and more specifically, as to why the Lord should revive you, you can plead to the Lord from the nature of the commandments themselves. And I think that's what He does in verses 151 and 152. He says, all your commandments are truth. Of old I have known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. God, your commandments that I desire to keep, they're true, and they are forever. In other words, they're eternal, that, that this will never change. Lord, you saved me that I might keep these so that I might do what is right in your sight. Now, if you plead that before the Lord and you say, Lord, save me that I might keep your commandments, that I might do your truth, that I might do that which you have founded forever, will the Lord not answer that? Will He not revive you? Will He not give you the grace to keep those commandments? Won't He deliver you from your enemies so that you might keep them? Well, I believe that the Lord will do that. Again, that's His purpose in bringing the trials in the first place so that you would cling to His truth and that you would do what it is He calls you to do. That's the whole purpose behind salvation, as we've said, to save you from your rebellion and to make you into obedient children of God. So the question is, why should you renew your obedience to the commandments of God? Well, you need to obey because unless you obey, He's not going to answer your prayers. It is the evidence that you belong to Him. It is the mark, as it were, the confirmation that His promises belong to you. Uh, you need to renew yourself, as it were, in, God's, in obedience to God's commandments because that's why the Lord sends the trials and the enemies in the first place to provoke you to seek Him. I mean, all that God does for you from the sending of His Son to the sending of these trials is to get you to obey Him better, to make you more like His Son. But as we've seen, you have to pray fervently. You have to pray with all your heart. The Lord wants you to know your need before He will meet that need. He wants you to sense it and to feel it and to cry out to Him with some measure of earnestness. You need to pray when you can. You need to pray early in the morning or late at night when your concern wakes you up. You need to seek Him and you need to offer reasons. God's nearness. His mercies to you in the Lord Jesus Christ, the virtues of His commandments, the fact that they never change, the fact that your opponents disregard God's law, and you must offer your prayer in faith, waiting upon the Lord until you see Him do what He promised that He would do. And so next time you're faced with a trial, and actually if I asked each one of you, I'd probably find that we're all going through some kind of a trial right now. Focus on these things 
do what it is the Lord calls you to do. Follow this example of the psalmist, and I think you'll discover that if you do this, the Lord will do certainly all that He has promised that He would because God is faithful. So remember the purpose behind it. Remember all, all that the Lord desires for you to do and renew your covenant with Him, your obedience to Him, and see what the Lord will do for you. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do what He has called us to do from this portion of Scripture this evening.